AIs are unlikely to lead us to gloom and doom or to nirvana. It's going to be a world of trade-offs. That's the adult conversation. It also means that most of the world's people are in favor of building up civilization, not tearing it down. We have to take that into consideration. But we also can't be Pollyannas or kind of ignoring the risks. We have to honor the uncertainty and risk and, and design in safeguards proactively so we're not uh, taken by surprise. The good news is that most of the world's energy and intellect and computer power and AI algorithms are on the side of good and, uh, and not on the side of tearing down civilization. I wouldn't automatically assume that regulation per se is the answer. I think that if people are very afraid of AI, they may uh, reflexively regulate it and they may not regulate it um, in a way that allows for innovation. So I think that we do need to have uh, thoughtful regulation, but we can't just assume that if we go at it with uh, zeal, uh, we're going to end up with thoughtful regulation. We may just end up with a lot of regulation that uh, is not that thoughtful. So I think I would be in favor of thoughtful regulation, but I'm not in favor of reflexive regulation. And I think that knowing the difference requires uh, people who are concerned about the impact on uh, society and social decision making and people who understand the technology well. The most important thing is to get thoughtful, informed people uh, at, from many different points of view in the room so that they can have a, a dialogue that doesn't talk past each other, that honors the good points that each group is making. And instead of scoring points against each other, they're looking for ways to honor each other's concerns and in the regulations. There are many people who are against using AI in the military. And uh, I, I reflect on the fact that they're a little late to that question, because we've been using AI in the military for decades now. And uh, the military, in particular DARPA and in the US and the Office of Naval Research and other groups have been very thoughtful and patient sponsors of AI research and they by and large have allowed AI researchers to both publish the technology and commercialize it. So many of the technologies that we associate with commercial developments today like um, AI agents and associates were DARPA projects for many years, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency projects, under the CALO program, the Cognitive Assistant that learns and organizes, and the PAL program, uh, personalized agent that, that learns. Uh, and those two became Siri, and they spun out of Stanford Research Institute, and Steve Jobs called them, and brought them into Apple, and then there were uh, lots of competitors that also built agents of this kind. But the vision for the, that style of agents and associates really came out of DARPA programs. Uh, and the military has built uh, AIs into fighter jets, for example, under the pilot's associate program, which started in the mid-'80s. And they're already part of these planes. If you saw the movie Top Gun, uh, Goose's job, Goose was the navigation and gunnery guy behind, behind the pilot, Tom Cruise. Um, Goose's job has been automated. Uh, and so uh, you may or may not like that, but that's a done deal. So there are questions about, that I think go to the heart of the matter, which is that humanistic people like myself and you and most of our viewers uh, want to see humanity resolve their problems through um, thoughtful dialogue and negotiation and goodwill 
And actually, most of the people that I've met in the military feel the same way. They just understand that sometimes you can't resolve problems that way, and you're under attack suddenly, and you, you need to do something about it, and you don't want to have your hands dangling at, at your sides if you're under attack. And in today's world, um, weapon systems used by our likely adversaries are going to have AIs built into them. Uh, you may not like that, you may want to ban that, but uh, there's not perfect adherence to uh, any bans or any uh, restrictions, and that means that you have to be able to respond in kind. And one last point about responding in kind is that the, uh, some people say, well, let's just build defensive AI, and that's fine, except that if you have two drones in the sky and one is a defensive drone and the other one is an offensive drone, it's very hard to tell them apart. They, they have to have equivalent or better capabilities, otherwise they can't uh, engage each other. And it's just the flip of a switch that turns a defensive uh, drone into an offensive drone. And the most important thing is to have, first, to try to avoid conflict with better policy and, and better um, sort of interstate interaction and uh, create incentives for avoiding war. But if you are in a situation where you're being attacked, I think that uh, one thing you can do, as long as it's still possible, is to have humans in the loop of any kill decisions, and that is the current uh, policy in the U.S. government. But if these systems are interacting with each other in uh, in a time frame that is much faster than the human nervous system, then you would hobble any defense capability if you insisted that humans get together and discuss the ramifications before these systems are, are able to respond. So as much as I don't like it either, that, that I think describes the situation on the ground today. And um, I don't think that uh, pronouncing that we're not going to build systems like that uh, puts us in good stead if, uh, if we're suddenly under attack. And given that we've published a huge amount of uh, the uh, capability for building systems of this kind in the open literature, it is absolutely naive to think that an adversary wouldn't be able to use that technology to modify present-day weapon systems. So I think our best shot is build a world of abundance where we um, increase the number of people that are enfranchised as opposed to disenfranchised, and we give people disincentives to be violent.